Hello, and welcome to another fully live Friday episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today we have our resident cryptozoologist and the producer of our show, Michael, on to uh, answer some questions and talk about the hacking news. Michael, let's start with the questions. Where have you been? Uh, well, I have been exploring the mountains and streams of northern Alaska to find the elusive Squatch. The Crypto Squatch, of course. I see. Um, <laughs> well, that's very exciting. Um, it looks like, well, it looks like we froze on my computer, but hopefully that doesn't uh, mm. impact the stream. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, today we're going to be going over some hacking news and also checking in with, of course, our mm -hmm. usual co-host who is not here today. Uh, Alex is going to be doing a very cool and exciting workshop coming up this week. So yeah, tomorrow. We, yeah, so if we switch over to my screen, um, if you are in Los Angeles and you want to do a really fun hacking workshop where you will learn to do some ducky script payloads and maybe do a little bit of soldering as well, uh, you can check out this workshop coming up tomorrow on the 16th. Oh, yeah, that is tomorrow uh, at Null Space Labs. And it's also really cool because if you want to support your local hacker space, this is also a great way to do it because we will be donating some of the ticket money to them. Mm -hmm. And also, you'll be supporting Alex and our content. So. Again, if you're in LA or if you know anybody in, uh, anybody in Los Angeles, you can check out our USB hacking workshop. I have retweeted it on my Twitter. You can also find it on both Universe, um, the Null Space Labs meetup group, mm -hmm. and our um, Cyber Weapons Lab Los Angeles meetup groups. So uh, yeah, uh, there's definitely still tickets left if you want to hang out with other cool hackers and learn how to do some cool hacking stuff. And I believe a uh, USB nugget is included uh, with the ticket price. So yeah, hopefully we'll, I will not be there, but hopefully Alex will see some of you there. He is busy preparing for that workshop, mm -hmm. which is why we have our uh, cryptozoologist guy here today. Yes. Uh, no, well, I answer a quick question. Uh, most of our Ducky Script related videos are on Hack5. So you can find those there. Yeah. Um, so also, you might have noticed that this week we did a live stream with uh, Serena, AKA She Networks. Mm -hmm. This is going really, really well on uh, this channel. It so far has the most views of, I think, any live stream that we've done so far. It's got 7,000. And it's only been up since the 8th. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we'll be able to have Serena back on because that was super fun and she was awesome. And uh, yeah, everybody seemed to really enjoy asking her yeah. questions. A um, couple weird marriage proposals <laughs> in, the, in the comments, which we had to remove. Please keep it respectful, gentlemen. But uh, overall, it was yeah. very fun to have uh, Serena on. And uh, mm -hmm. I hope she had a great time as well. Um, yeah, th just also uh, going through the Hack 5 content. If you haven't seen it, there's another episode that's doing super well that just came out this week, and it's Alex going through how to track down hidden cameras with Wireshark. Mm -hmm. So does that sound like another episode we did already, which is what some of the uh, random commenters on here said? Did you do this already? Is why? How often you bring that topic again? <laughs> Another person demanded to know. Um, well, so the number one piece of feedback we got on mm -hmm. the viral video we did on whether Wireshark can be used to find hidden cameras for free was that we didn't show enough of you know how you can do it. Yeah, yeah, like the technical details. So you know we wanted to do that like a MythBuster style episode where we using our skills, mm -hmm. judge whether or not it's actually good at this sort of thing. And we found, actually, yeah, it is pretty good at this sort of thing. So we wanted to do a follow-up episode where you know Alex actually goes through and mm -hmm. shows you exactly how to use this tool to find a hidden Wi-Fi device uh, that might be like a, you know, a camera or something else that's just around the house that you uh, might not know about. So this is a really good guide. It uses a directional antenna. So mm -hmm. it does require one piece of equipment in order to make it a little easier to sweep around and find like what direction you need to be walking in. But if you have an omnidirectional antenna and you're just walking around and playing hot and cold mm -hmm. with the transmission source, you can still find the general area that it's in. So a directional antenna is great as uh, is in this video, but if you just have an omnidirectional antenna, it's still totally possible to use Wireshark to identify suspicious devices around your home and then maybe be able to find out exactly where they are by their signal strength. So, so far, 15,000 views. It's only been up for three, two days now. Oh, wow. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. it's really, really uh, good. So if you haven't seen it, this is one of our, I think, our best videos to date. It's one of the mm -hmm. first videos also that Alex has produced by himself. So uh, if you want to give him some, ni some nice feedback, it's always appreciated. I really enjoyed this episode. I feel like it has a really good amount of momentum to it, and the B-roll on it is really fun. So if you like it too, please let us know in the comments. Um, I think that I think that's it for our updates. Um, oh, also, so we are doing a video on warshipping. So, Michael, what is warshipping? 
Uh, so worshiping is no, no, not Bigfoot, not not the Squatch. Oh, sorry, I, not worshiping. Yeah, yeah, no. oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, not not sad. your mm. personal quest. I'm talking <laughs> about you know sending a package with uh, malicious hardware mm -hmm. in it. Okay, yeah. So basically, like you said, it's uh, sending a package, um, you know, with like uh, Wi-Fi pineapple or or some other hacking uh, wireless hacking device uh, to a company. And assuming you're sending it to a person that no longer works there or um, a person that's on vacation, the package is going to be able to sit around in that environment. And then you're able to uh, remote into that device and have access to the premises. And this can be really effective uh, if you normally wouldn't be able to get access uh, through other social engineering methods. Yeah, so I have... <clears throat> been here talking about stories where people are using air tags mm -hmm. to do all sorts of nefarious things. And in our story that we're trying to do, we're trying to test whether or not companies will just allow a package to linger on their premises for a certain amount of time. So our idea was we'll take these trackers and mm -hmm. we'll send them to certain companies and we'll we'll measure how long they actually let it sit in their mm -hmm. mailroom to, to kind of figure out whether or not this is a viable attack. So uh, we went ahead and tried that, and Michael used a bunch of tile trackers. Mm -hmm. And tile trackers are great, but they only work yeah. if someone has the tile app. So uh, there's a lot less receivers out there. So my idea was, let's use AirTags. So um, AirTags can be detected by nearby phones if they've been separated mm -hmm. by, uh, from their owner for X amount of, of, of time. And newer iPhones can even do what's called precision tracking. And I didn't know about this, where they can use their phone to find exactly like the direction Whoa. and distance that the AirTag is and really track it down quickly. This is only mm -hmm. the, the newest iPhone models, and I did not know this. So if this is news to you, then you learned something this week. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that in theory, if I were to send out these AirTag trackers to try to do our episode, then employees who have the newest iPhone, which would hopefully be you know upper management or something, I guess if they're fancy, would be like, wait, what is this? And be able to very yeah. quickly go and find out it's in this package. Um, now, there's not too much I can do about that, but one thing that makes it a lot easier is you can select an AirTag and make it play a sound. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and I tested what an Android user would see if they suspected they were being tracked by an AirTag, and I uh, was able to see that even Android users, if they scan for an AirTag, are able to trigger it to play a noise. So I wanted to see like how easy is it to actually remove the speaker from this. Okay, mm -hmm. so the necessary components, a single flathead screwdriver. With that one mm. tool and some bravery, any idiot could remove an AirTag speaker and make it so that when anybody is trying to track it down and doesn't have this advanced mm -hmm. fancy new iPhone and they want to hear you know, a noise to track it down audibly, uh, it's impossible to do so because the device still works exactly the same. It's just mm -hmm. now silence and there's no, there's, there's no um, way that it can tell that it's been silenced and it keeps working exactly the same. Mm. So we've been talking for a long time about the risks of air tags and how they can be used for surveillance. And what I've found so far in making our episode is it is frighteningly easy to silence mm. these sorts of things and make it much more difficult for Android users, for example, to tell if they're being tracked. Yeah, so with the uh, air tags, how long do they have to be around someone before it starts being like, hey, this is stalking you? As soon as it's away from a user, uh, from its primary user, for at least I think like it's between like 15 and 30 minutes. Something oh, like okay. Because I was going to say, uh, not to get too much into our preliminary research, but certain companies typically will return the packages to sender within a day, while other companies will keep it much longer. And so I was wondering if, with some companies that return it within a day, if it wouldn't even show up on their radar. Uh, no, in order to get fine tracking, you would yeah. need to report it as lost, which means that other people would see it and there would be a message mm. associated with it when they like uh, detected it was an air tag and queried it to get gotcha. more information. Um, but it's really easy to set them up. It's really easy to disable the audio. Uh, overall, mm -hmm. it's been a, a pretty scary experiment. So uh, air tags are definitely sketchy as trackers and we'll see what kind of efficacy they have being used to support our argument in our episode that companies will mm -hmm. actually let a package that could have something malicious inside it. In this case, just a tracker, but right. maybe in the future, it would be something really bad. Uh, mm -hmm. Sit in their mail room, sit in their headquarters, and sit in their building, potentially in range of sensitive wireless networks. Yeah, yeah, and I could think of even worse things in like a Wi-Fi pineapple, like, uh... You know, a um, let's cut away from Ron Swanson. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, his, his violence <laughs> is inspiring me to want to like hit my own computer with a hammer. Yes, um, but yeah, people in the comments are saying it. Uh, the air tags use ultra wide band, mm -hmm. so you know, I had thought they were Bluetooth, but that's really cool that they're using ultra wide band. Um, 
It would also be interesting in these packages, you know, you could include things like an SDR, a software-defined radio, so you could eavesdrop on other wireless signals that might be in the environment. Um, you know, you could also turn it into a rogue cell tower and, and start trying to intercept um, cellular, cellular communications uh, there as well. Oh, that's very funny. So one of the things I said um, earlier when Michael raised the, the prospect of making a Hack 5 episode about how to remove a speaker from an AirTag tracker is that I didn't want to destroy the cottage industry of people <laughs> who just yeah. do that and turn around and sell them on eBay um, for anybody who's not brave mm -hmm. enough to like find a screwdriver. Um, again, I think that there's really serious like ethical problems with turning every single person's into a phone into like a a mm -hmm. tracker without their consent uh, that's able to ping on these mm -hmm. things and then basically, you know, rat out the location of these sorts of trackers that have no real authentication for what they're being used for. They're just so easy to abuse. It's just, I feel like we're at a point where we're like midway between Apple having to admit that like, okay, these are abused all the time. Yeah. Like we need to, like the next generation of these need to be like locked down in some ways, or maybe the current version of these need to be disabled in certain types of ways that might make them a little mm -hmm. bit less useful. I feel like that's what's coming because um, I, I have been tracking Michael over here by putting a silence air tag in mm -hmm. the back of his vehicle, which he knows about, of course. But as an Android user, have you been notified at all? No. And I've just been dropping your location in our group chat, like yeah. regularly. Yeah, yeah so I have like, no indication. Of, as a person that uses a Pixel and is completely in the Google ecosystem, I have no indication. I know there's an app I can download, but I never downloaded that app. And I think that would probably be the average Android person's position too. Like maybe a handful of people would be paranoid enough to preemptively download such an app. But. Yeah, I mean, if you have like a like a partner who's like you mm -hmm. know sketchy or something, and you're worried about them tracking you, then if you were to download this and scan it, I found that it was also partially broken. So hmm. um, I was able to query. The, I was able to identify the AirTag. Uh, identified it was in lost mode, so it was t actively tracking. I was able to. Um, attempt to play a noise on it, which didn't work, of mm -hmm. course, because it disabled the speaker. And then I was uh, supposed to be able to query more information about the user. So that was supposed to be the little like lost message that you mm -hmm. set up when you set it to lost, and it didn't work. It was broken. <laughs> so the current app that's supposed to be able to detect AirTag trackers on Android is n it doesn't even mm -hmm. work all the way, and wow. doesn't really actually allow you to identify the owner of a tracker. So I mean, I'm, we're kind of taking a lot of time on this, but it is yeah. really fascinating to me how these trackers have made it so so easy, at least for an Android user, to be completely and very accurately tracked at any moment and then also have no real ability to figure out who did it. Like you can mm -hmm. have a suspicion, but if you've just got like, you know, a, a duct tape air tag that's been silenced to you, like, you know, mm -hmm. on your thing, unless you physically search the entire area on an Android phone, there's no even way to tell when you're getting hot and cold. All you know yeah. is that it's just close to you. So I was really disappointed to see that the Android app for querying uh, nearby AirTags to find out more information about their owner was broken. And also, I would point out that the information here is voluntary. So the information I would have got if mm -hmm. it was actually working properly is I would be able to see uh, basically the uh, phone number associated with the lost item and then whatever like little default message about mm -hmm. like, please, you know, contact me to return it. But I can put a fake phone number in there. And then unless they get like the police involved, there's really not much more information I'm going to get. So yeah, I, I still see very serious mm -hmm. problems with accountability when it comes to air tag trackers. And it's been an interesting process, like getting used to them and, and using them as a, a research tool for this episode coming up. So yeah, very sketchy. I, I would love it. Well, I, I know there was someone trying to reverse engineer them when they first came out, but I would love it if uh, someone was able to reverse engineer it and make it where you can flash custom firmware to them, because that would be really cool. Um, well, they basically made it so you can also create fake air tags. So you can mm. use like a, I think like a Raspberry Pi or something uh, oh, to just like cool. flash and create an air tag. It might have been an ESP32 mm -hmm. actually. I don't know. I'll have to look it up again. But um, you could basically then use any single phone um, mm -hmm. as a detector for that and then query to get its location. So it was really weird to be able to like create a fictitious air tag basically because mm -hmm. it makes it even harder because then you know if it's if it's like an emulated or faked device on this detection network then how do you find the owner if it's not behaving the way that it should because it's like yeah. a knockoff. I don't know. It's it's a, a lot of really interesting stuff around those trackers. But all right, I guess let's get started with the news. Okay. Uh give me just a second. Do -do -do. Uh, so on my screen, we have one of the first news pieces that I have, which is about, you say Pipel is how you pronounce that? Yeah, what was the way you pronounced it? Uh, 
Pie Pie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think pie pie sounds cuter. It's uh, pie pole. Pie. Okay, anyway, so uh, yeah. as we've covered in previous news segments, mm -hmm. um, they've had issues with uh, packages uh, getting hacked and then um, hackers inserting malicious code into a commonly used packages, um, and then that obviously causes problems for people. So in a recent effort to uh, help their brand and increase security, uh, they basically went to the top 1% uh, of used packages over the past six months and they um, forced those developers to enable two-factor. And you know, to be fair, they um, were willing to ship out uh, free uh, two, 2FA uh, security tokens and keys and such. Um, so they were not like charging them or anything and, and trying to increase the security. However, one of these developers uh, did not take kindly to that. He hates security. He, I, I'm not going to say hates security, but I, you know, if you... Uh, he hates to be told what to do. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he decided that he was just going to delete his uh, repository and it was a very commonly used repository. So. It just absolutely broke a bunch of people's programs that were reliant on it. Um, you know, and this brings up uh, a topic that we've talked about uh, multiple times on these news streams, and that is, you know, when you have these open source developers, but then um, industry relies on them, you, ha you have this weird, like, dichotomy uh, where in some ways they're unpaid employees. Um, so, you know, it, if it's his project and he volunteers for it, he, in theory, should be able to take it down at will. Um, but yeah, so it caused a lot of issues with companies and then uh, Pipel had to step in and like um, re-upload the code, uh, the repository. Um, so it was just a real big mess. And I think it really highlights uh, these issues of, um, you know, who owns open source code and do you have a right to take it down? Um, and then also like, um, is it possible or, or should it be ethically uh, okay to force two-factor or stronger security on people. So, some very interesting questions. Yeah, I think it, it's an interesting debate because on one side, if you are an open source developer, you get mm -hmm. to choose how people can access your code. So, you know, having it on like a distribution channel means that at a certain point, that distribution channel becomes a vector of attack for not just you, but every mm -hmm. other person who has a very popular package that's used in, in a supply chain sense by other software like mm -hmm. that could be absolutely everywhere like log4j being an, an absolutely great example of like yeah. how widespread these sorts of dependencies can be so if there's a vulnerability or a problem or a supply chain attack then you know obviously this is an ecosystem that's extremely vulnerable and we've seen it over and over and over so if you're going to participate in supplying software to users and that is the business that you're in like I understand that you should be able to run, you know, whatever, however you want. Mm -hmm. But if you're using a channel in order to get access to all these people, or, or at least like get your software to all these people in an efficient way, um, you know, it, it sucks, of course, to have to implement 2FA, whatever else. But if there's active cases of people mm -hmm. having very real harm done to their projects via this distribution channel, yeah. I kind of feel like it's the distribution channel's prerogative to instill trust in their users mm -hmm. by making sure that people are abiding by at least the very minimum of standards. And if you are not using 2FA nowadays, mm -hmm. like, like maybe you have it on, like, but that's the thing, like you can use an authenticator app on your phone, mm -hmm. have a backup phone, like your old phone or something with the cracked screen that has your backup 2FA account just in case something happens. But Always have like you know two uh, at least two backup factors that you can go back mm -hmm. to, and then there's there's not really like a problem. It's annoying every once in a while, but like it doesn't ask you for your two factor authentication, like mm -hmm. unless you're doing something that's very specifically risky, like logging in again after a long time or pushing like code that's going to go everywhere. Like it's it's pretty common sense that passwords are terrible nowadays for keeping your stuff safe. They just can be stolen easily. They can mm -hmm. be like bought. They can be like rotated poorly. Uh, like there's lots of different ways this can happen. So pretending that it doesn't happen mm -hmm. is not doing your users any any service, especially when they're accessing it through a channel that's constantly been under attack by people who realize this. So I don't honestly have a lot of sympathy for the developer here. Like mm -hmm. I feel like. Yeah, cool. Like you're you're doing open source code and stuff, but like if you're going to be publishing that's something that's useful with the intention of people using it, then like pulling it abruptly mm -hmm. from the repository and breaking everyone's projects, like it makes yeah. it makes people probably want to find an alternative. 
Um, especially if it's just over like implementing security that's in the mm -hmm. end like trusting, uh, well, helping your users trust the supply chain that they're getting the software through. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, it was not a very flattering temp uh, temper tantrum in my opinion, uh, just because mm -hmm. like so many people were caught up in it unintentionally. Um, but again, I am not uh, an open source developer, so I don't, I, I, I imagine I would uh, probably be pretty put off by like having somebody decide who and who gets access to my right. like, uh, software and how. Oh, uh, that, that's the part that would upset me is uh, Pipel going back in and then re-adding the code after I already deleted it. Because like ostensibly, if I created the code, then it's my property. Even if I let other people use it for free, I still ultimately own it. But uh, that digresses too much. Um, so the other story I have here that relates is Apple attempting to kill the password once again. And um, the, the main thing here is essentially Apple is trying to move us towards using more security keys uh, and stuff like that. And what they're attempting to do is make your Apple devices your security key hmm. um, and using the biometrics that are often present on those devices. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's good in the sense that um, you're navigating away from passwords that can be very insecure, such as, you know, password one, two, three, and all these common passwords. Um, and so you're not going to be able to brute force with word list and, and um, those sorts of things. However, um, a concern brought up by Wired and some other researchers um, is the element of how we can lock you into an ecosystem. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, if if your Apple device is the only way you can sign in to things, like you don't have a password, then what happens if you, you know, break your uh, Apple iPhone? Or what if you decide you want to become an Android person, right? Like how, you know, is there a clear way for you to go over? And it's not just Apple that's, um, like, th this particular article is about Apple trying to do this with um, iOS 16 and macOS uh, Ventura. Um, but other companies are trying to do this, and then it's also being uh, pushed what, by the, how do you say that, FIDO Alliance? Yeah. Yeah, the FIDO Alliance, which, you know, and, and again, I think this is good security practice. Using hardware keys is definitely a good thing, but then I also I question, so how does that work with two-factor then? So is it two-factor in the sense that you have to have the, the physical device and then a biometric on it? Um, in that sense, I guess you could have two-factor that way. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting seeing where uh, we're going going forward with how you log into your accounts. Uh, yeah, I, I see a grimmer future also where people mm -hmm. are like, hey, why are you using your pinky to sign into your phone? And you're like, <laughs> oh, I can't use my other three fingers. I got mm -hmm. fished. And they're like, what? And it's like, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was using oh. my fingerprint somewhere and someone mm -hmm. captured it. And now... You know, they make a fake fingerprint. They can get mm -hmm. into all my accounts. I'm just like, what? Like, you know, that's the future I see. Because, like, in some cases, biometrics as passwords aren't always a good idea. Mm -hmm. How often can you change your fingers? Uh, you can count easily. Um, so that's the problem. It's like if you're if you're using like a biometric, and then that biometric mm -hmm. gets captured in in any way, shape, or form. Like, what are your options? Yeah. You know, like it's not like a password you can just infinitely change and then like remember. It's like it's a bit more difficult and it's mm -hmm. a bit more tricky. So uh, I have some concerns yeah. with that like long term, like in the kind of future it might create. But um, well, we, we also have a question in the yeah. chat and that's uh, uh, is, can you do Arch for uh, hacking development? And I use, as uh, Zam pointed out, Manjaro on a Raspberry Pi all the time and it works very well. And mm -hmm. you can download all the Black Arch tools onto it and it works great. Someone else said, um, Black Arch on a USB only can that be done. Um, I mean, and yes, that that absolutely would work as well. But I really mm -hmm. like Manjaro on a Raspberry Pi, or just Manjaro in general. So that's something else you can use. Uh, yeah, and just some final thoughts on this uh, Wired piece. Like, I, I think it will increase the security of certain members of the population who use very insecure passwords or use the same password on multiple platforms. Because uh, in a sense, it would also work as a password manager. Uh, in that regard. But yeah, I share similar concerns, especially like with how good cameras are these days and how common it is for people to post photos of themselves. Um, you know, that starts to get into things like if you're using Face ID, you know, could you recreate uh, their face from Instagram photos and, and do a three-dimensional face to unlock uh, and, you know, 
images of their hands, you could get their fingerprints, uh, stuff like that. Um, I don't know has been fully considered yet, but again, it would be more secure than it is now, so I think it's a, at least a step in the right direction. Okay, so let's go over to my screen, and we can see a very interesting development this week um, that has a lot of um, subtext if you know where to look for it. So this is the rolling pwn attack. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, against modern vehicles equipped with a remote keyless entry system and also using a uh, rolling code. So do you know what a rolling code is? Um, basically what the name implies that it's a um, like an algorithm that generates uh, a code that's unique for each time it's used. So that way it makes it harder to do things like replay attacks, uh, such as like old garage door openers would use a single like authentication code or a pin that would be uh, used over and over and over. And so if you just lit recorded that attack, you could replay the attack and open the garage door. Uh, so a rolling code is supposed to defeat that. However, there have been man in the middle type attacks before where you like relay the code um, as it's rolling or you're able to capture and store several rolling codes that are still valid um, and other attacks like that. Yeah, so um, I have to be totally honest here. The description here has a little bit of um, strange English in some parts that <laughs> make it a, a tiny bit difficult for me to understand exactly how this is working. So overall, um, the, the problem here seems to be the vehicle receiver even though it's designed to prevent replay attacks, will accept a sliding window of codes to avoid accidental key presses by design. And then by sending the commands in a consecutive sequence to Honda vehicles, it will be resynchronizing the counter. So basically setting it back over so older codes can be used again. So it looks like what's happening here is by being able to reset the counter on this rolling code, they're able to then use the same different codes that have been used in the past that should be kind of locked out or no longer valid, but for some reason are being enabled again. So they, um, in lieu of showing exactly how it works technically, they've mm -hmm. opted to take many videos of them just <laughs> doing this okay. on various vehicles. And you can see here, this is working against a Honda CRV. Um, you can see it working against a Honda Accord. You can see it against a Honda Odyssey and a Honda XRV. So um, really, really interesting mm -hmm. stuff here because this controls, for example, getting into the vehicle and getting direct physical access to the rest of the hardware. So if you yeah. know how to start a Honda once you're inside it, or if this could potentially extend to starting the vehicle as well, then uh, that's a pretty serious issue. Mm -hmm. Now, where the subtext on this particular disclosure is, uh, is that it looks like they've reached out to Honda, and Honda really does not plan to do much about problems with older models of cars. They're not really in the business of security, and as far as they were able to see, there is no actual mm -hmm. security team to deal with problems like this at Honda. So um, here's where this gets interesting. When asked why they call this, uh, let's see, rolling pwn and not honda pwn because the bug may exist in other brands of vehicles too winky, winky face. face so <clears throat> here's my theory i think that this is actually an extremely mm -hmm. widespread bug and in fact honda is the only one that's just been like we don't care and we're not mm -hmm. going to do anything to fix it mm. it probably exists that there's other manufacturers who are now aware of this bug and that are somewhere in the disclosure process which is why no proof of concept and no other information mm -hmm. is very carefully uh being uh, released so i would say it's it's probably going to be in the news fairly soon that mm -hmm. this bug actually impacts like a much broader range of vehicles than is currently being disclosed and that's why it's interesting to see that this proof of concept while kind of quietly released is still probably going to be something that's disclosed and maybe on be on like the more conventional mm -hmm. news later on when it's revealed that like many 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 other vehicles are also vulnerable to this so um obviously being able to get unauthorized access to a vehicle is pretty serious and the fact that this exists and will probably not be fixed on basically every modern honda mm -hmm. vehicle with keyless entry is a huge problem because i own two so um yeah that's pretty discouraging to hear and uh, i guess we'll have to see how many other vehicles end up being impacted by this bug Mm -hmm. um, so another Apple-related story, since you raised okay. something on Apple security, is the new announcement of lockdown mode. 
So mm. they're previewing this mode at, mostly for people who've been targeted by mercenary spyware. And this is things like, um, you know, all the, the sorts of like NSO group related Pegasus type malware that has been out there hitting journalists and hitting human rights defenders and other people who have powerful enemies with lots of money. So this, because uh, Apple has been involved in so many of these and is currently in litigation with NSO Group and is also trying really hard to repair its brand after uh, being a primary target of these sorts of groups, this is a step towards making it so much harder for these developers who are trying to get into Apple devices to be able to do the kinds of tricks that they've done in the past. So what Lockdown Mode does is it plays on lessons learned from some of these prior attacks and makes it so that messages no longer uh, accept any attachment types other than images. And that means a lot of these exotic attacks where they're sending mm. like a specially crafted file or you know something like a like an animation that has like a secret like CPU embedded in the code or whatever, all this like crafty weird stuff that they've done, it's just not gonna work. And some of the access to old exotic libraries with uh, bugs in them that can be exploited, this is also locked down as well. So when web browsing, certain complex web technologies like just-in-time JavaScript compilation are disabled, um, unless the user specifically selects websites to opt out of this. And that means if you were to send a user a link and they clicked on it, so-called like a, a one-click mm -hmm. exploit, then opening that link would no longer make it so that they were as exposed to some of these really easy to exploit mm -hmm. technologies that are frankly disproportionately powerful and allow for attackers to have a lot of, uh, of room to kind of like deploy whatever they're going to deploy. Um, this is really going to make it a lot harder to use web-based exploits. So that's why this improvement is so important. Um, Apple services. So incoming invitations and service requests, including FaceTime calls, are blocked if the user has not previously sent the initiator a call or request. So very frequently, they might find a bug in the FaceTime protocol or something like that, and then make it so that an unknown number randomly sends you a request in the middle of the night or something and triggers this bug. Um, that would be a zero interaction where you don't even need to accept it in order for this to become an issue. So in order to lock down those protocols and insulate them against random numbers, being able to deploy a bug in like FaceTime, iMessage, or something like that, where they can initiate something uh, just by sending you a request, this will lock it down to the point that those sorts of attacks, you will have to be tricked into messaging them first, which is a whole extra step that, that most people you know, haven't had to go through in order to be infected. Um, wired connectors from a computer or accessory are blocked when the iPhone is locked. So if you were to leave your phone in a room, if you were to leave your phone unattended and someone were to plug it in very quickly, this would disable all the different things they could potentially do by directly connecting your phone to a computer. That means some of these fancy hacking techniques that require momentary physical access would be blocked by default and make it so you would need to be there and unlock the phone in order to enable the kinds of vulnerabilities that would allow them to maybe like add something to the firmware or jailbreak your device and do something to it. And then lastly, configurable profiles can't be installed. Uh, the device can't be enrolled into mobile device management while lockdown mode is on. So some of these attacks have been focusing on installing a profile that secretly and silently adds maybe like another forwarding number or a forwarding email for all messages that are coming into you. Um, this will make it so that that is not possible unless your organization like wants that to happen and that's your intent and at which point you would need to disable lockdown mode in order to do it. So all these are again direct reactions to like mm -hmm. Pegasus malware and other things that have been impacting the ability of these phones to stay secure. And a lot of these things will be potentially literally a lifesaver for the mm -hmm. people who are using these on iOS devices. So it really makes iOS devices very attractive again to people who have concerns about security because it really is smart for Apple to be learning from the lessons of them really getting beat up by these mercenary mm -hmm. groups uh, in terms of their reputation and coming back with a system that is so much more difficult. Now here's the best part. If you want to mess up uh, lockdown mode, if you're motivated and you want to find a, a way to break it out, um, $2 million oh, is wow. the, the highest possible bounty. And that is actually the highest bounty on the market, for, I think, for any vulnerability um, is what they were bragging about in this specific. Oh, yeah. Uh, the highest maximum bounty payout in the industry. Wow. Um, so I actually have a story related to this, uh, which is about Microsoft researchers finding an exploit for Mac OS. So this is in relation um, to running a uh, Microsoft document on a Mac OS computer. Uh, essentially, for uh, Word to have backward compatibility, um, 
Word is allowed to read and write files that come uh, a pin uh, with prefix um, tilde, is that squiggly mm -hmm. line? Yeah. Uh, squiggly, yeah, tilde uh, dollar sign. So essentially what the researchers were able to do is create this um, Python document which was uh, assigned that prefix and then by inserting commands into that Python document uh, they were able to run some malicious code and you can actually see it down here. They got it down and they put out a proof of concept video um, and so these four lines of code are basically all you need to do to break out of a um, sandbox using a Microsoft Word macro. Uh, luckily this has got patched in May um, and got reported to Apple last year. But does show that uh, the sandbox environments are not as infallible uh, as you might hope sometimes. Mm. So one thing to note is most of this protection is for iOS. So that would be on like a like an iOS. iPhone. Yeah, iPhone. Yeah. But yeah, gotcha. no, still, um, if you can find a vulnerability like this, you can definitely make some money now through Apple's uh, security program. It's all just kind of like a, a good indication for Apple as a security-focused company mm -hmm. that they're spending so many resources on making sure that vulnerabilities are paid off very handsomely um, by turning them into the right source. Right. So obviously you can make a lot more money in the past by turning them into these mercenary groups. Mm -hmm. And that's where Apple, I think, is finally doing the right thing in terms of really prioritizing these bugs because they realize how critical this is to their reputation to, to be hacked so many times when previously it, it wasn't really very often that like Apple products were hacked. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, you know, I was talking to some friends the other day, and they were like still under the uh, notion that Macs were unhackable. And I was like, no. Maybe back in the day, you know, statistically speaking, there was fewer pe people using Macs, so hackers would write code for other systems. Mm -hmm. But now they're very common, uh, and there are definitely as many flaws uh, in Apple systems as there are Windows or Linux and other systems um, since more people use those devices now. All right, so over on my screen, we have uh, an unfortunate security decision that's been going back and forth in the news. Um, so m what are what are macros, Michael? Do you uh, remember what those are? It's a chunk of code that can be, or, or basically, yeah, it's like a program, sort of, is it a programming language? Not really a programming language. Yeah, so it's a way to run action. So for example, uh, you can make a macro in a Word document that will perform a uh, predetermined set of actions mm -hmm. um, useful in Excel and other things like that. Yeah, so it makes it so it can launch applications and do mm -hmm. things like that. And you can use that in order to script some pretty bad things. And it's just a very, very easy way to do bad stuff when somebody, somebody just mm -hmm. opens up a file. So typically, this uh, should be disabled, but often it will be enabled by default. And because of that, it allows attackers to run bad code on people's computers by simply sending them a malicious document. So Microsoft finally was like, OK, OK, we can't ignore this anymore. This is a huge problem. Um, and I myself have done demos on doing this. It is so incredibly easy that it is uh, incredible to me that this was left on by default for such a long time. Um, but if it were turned off by default, then it would be the user who would have to go through and manually enable macros in order to add content. And they would be getting all these warnings as well, talking about all the bad things that could happen. Mm -hmm. So it really would scare most people off, I think, of, of enabling it because it's really like you know telling, telling you mm -hmm. that this is suspicious, you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it over and over again. So there was a lot of uh, pushback by some people who you know, maybe rely on macros to do things. Uh, and Microsoft initially decided to back off of this and had put off the day that they were going to actually disable this um, by default. And that caused a lot of further backlash by the security community who was really upset that this very well-known vector for attacks was going to be um, basically made available for attackers again. Now it seems that Microsoft has said this was temporary. Following user feedback, we have mm -hmm. rolled back the change temporarily while we make some additional changes to enhance usability. This is a temporary change. And we are fully committed to making the default change for all users. Um, this is a more recent update. So Microsoft kind of going back and forth on whether or not this critical security <laughs> issue is going to be finally solved. 
Mm -hmm. My opinion, of course, is that it is so easy for attackers to leverage this that it really mm -hmm. doesn't make sense for this very dangerous option to be left on by default. The majority of users are going to be more at risk to this than they are benefiting from it being on by default. So uh, it just doesn't really make sense to delay like putting mm -hmm. it off any further because I myself feel confident that I could write a basic macro script to do like a, basically whatever I want. And if the user was tricked into clicking on it, then I would have access to their computer, I could ransomware them, I could do all sorts of bad stuff. So it's a very, very common vulnerability that mm -hmm. everybody knows about, and it doesn't take a computer science degree in order to attack someone using this flaw. Yeah, and if you're wondering how bad a macro uh, attack like this can be, uh, yes. I have a pretty good article. Uh, I don't think that... Yeah, it was, oh, I thought you were going to talk about the video where you got blown up for clicking on Oh, the, yes. Uh, I mean, macro. there's that as well. Um, but the Lazarus group um, has been using an, um, a tactic new for them, which is the fake job offer. Nice. So essentially what they were able to do is perform a $540 million heist. Um, and essentially what they did is they hit up several senior engineers at this company, and made job offers through uh, link, or the uh, initiated job offers through LinkedIn, um, had the person go through multiple interviews, and then sent them a document uh, which was their uh, job offer package, right? Mm -hmm. uh, saying, you know, th this is what we're willing to provide you. You know, um, I'm ass assuming there was some like NDA stuff, t that sort of typical paperwork. Well, it turns out. Um, that was a malicious document. They were able to gain access to that senior engineer's account <laughs> uh, and then move laterally through the network uh, and still $540 million. Just from a really what I think is a pretty clever, sophisticated uh, phishing campaign. Because, you know, I, I don't think uh, the average person, you know, if they're maybe a little disgruntled at work, they're looking for other jobs, and, they're, and then you go all the way through what you perceive to be a legitimate... Um, interviewing process, I don't think you would question um, uh, opening a document and, and maybe enabling macros or something like that. Yeah, speaking of macros, um, if we switch over to my screen, we can see a real video of Michael accidentally opening a malicious macro document. Let's, let's watch what happens. There it is. He enables the macro. The attacker is able to run the script. The computer starts immediately having problems and running slow and boom. I wish y'all could hear the uh, Russian national, or the USSR national anthem. They're the same. Yeah, okay. One just doesn't have words. So as you can see, Michael was almost killed by opening this malicious yes. office document. So please be careful with macros until Microsoft takes the step of actually disabling them by default. Yeah. Um, so I do have another article um, in relation to... Um, Microsoft doing security updates. Give me just a second to pull this up. Um, so, auto patch is basically a feature which forces security updates. Um, so, Microsoft is now rolling that out for enterprise systems. What I find really interesting too here is because, you know, uh, in an enterprise environment or other critical environment, uh, you really don't want to upload a patch that may or may not break your systems, right? Um, so essentially what they have here is the ability to um, auto schedule um, a mandatory patch that installs itself. Um, so you have, I think it's four series of groups. Uh, you have a test group with, and then you have, um, assuming it works with the test group, then you roll it out to the first 1% of devices, then the next 9% uh, of devices, and then uh, you cover the rest of the um, corporate devices. And I think this is a pretty practical thing because I know a, a very common problem is people not installing updates or not updating their systems in a timely manner. I don't think this is going to be the solution for all systems because there are certain systems such as um, machines in uh, healthcare or other industries like that which are regulated by various laws and governmental organizations where they may be forced by law to keep a certain revision of an OS um, until it can get tested and then be updated. Um, but for most environments, I think this is a good solution uh, to get users to actually update their things. Just don't give them the choice not to. 
All right, over on my screen, we have a user saying, let's get to the tools. This is boring. All right, fine. <laughs> um, so a former CIA engineer was convicted of leaking the Vault 7 hacking tools to WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. So if you all remember this, uh, it was a while ago, a bunch of very sophisticated hacking tools developed by the US government were leaked. And this obviously caused a lot of problems for mm -hmm. uh, the people who were deploying them. They wanted to know who had leaked them. Uh, and also, they were no longer able to use a lot of these methods to break into vehicles, TVs, web browsers, desktops, and mobile operating systems. So these tools covered a lot of different things that the government was basically breaking into without obviously like a warrant or anything. Uh, and the methods that they were doing them were very, very sophisticated. And once the source code was out there, this really caused a lot of a stir. So why did he do it? How much money did he make? Um, well, he didn't make any money. He was upset. Instead, um, he apparently was a disgruntled employee who did not appreciate the lack of um, attention he got to his complaints mm -hmm. about the workplace conditions and some other issues he had. So as revenge, he began downloading all the information. And then once he left the agency, proceeded to give it to uh, WikiLeaks, who then subsequently published it. Wow. So um, he's been convicted of this now and uh, was, again, just like a programmer mm -hmm. working for the CIA. So one of the um, one of the like use cases for Veronis is like when someone starts like downloading large amounts of proprietary code uh, because they're upset or angry. Um, so it's funny to see uh, that this keeps happening. Uh, that like these major breaches mm -hmm. happen because like even after like the Edward Snowden thing and everything else, there's still upset employees who have access mm -hmm. to you know within their normal scope of their job these tools that are highly sensitive and then download them mm -hmm. and proceed to walk out the door with them and share them with people they're not supposed yeah. to. Yeah, no, I, I legitimately believe that um, you know obviously for a long time insider threats have been a, a big issue and I believe it will continue uh, to grow as an issue going forward. Um, you know, it's a, a good reminder to c treat your employees well and, you know, make sure you treat them fairly. Um, otherwise, you end up in situations like that. All right, so we have another interesting piece of news from Microsoft, and this is of a adversary in the middle, mm -hmm. phishing attack, uh, used against about 10,000 organizations. So this is an interesting attack because, in particular, it is going through 2FA. So it's using a proxy site that is hosted via a proxy server. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is getting around accounts that have 2FA by sitting in the middle and accepting the cookie that they get back from the mm. user doing their normal 2FA. So let's say that the user has like a phone-based 2FA. They will stand up a site that actually attempts to do a real login to the website you know, behind it. Uh, and when it generates a two-factor code, it'll uh, send that code to the mm -hmm. user, the user will input it into the proxy site, and then the proxy site will initiate a login to the real website that's kind of just sitting behind it. So the user will be sitting there interacting with an identical looking website that looks mm -hmm. like the real website they're trying to log into, but instead they're actually interacting with the malicious version that's intercepting everything, including their 2FA code. So this is a much more active way of breaking into users' accounts because it requires you to kind of sit over their shoulder as they do a mm -hmm. login and get their two-factor code. But because 2FA has become so common and is enforced in so many organizations, this is a very sophisticated attack. And frankly, attacks have to be this sophisticated now, uh, now in order to get really well-defended targets that are using mm -hmm. uh, you know, the security policy their organization mandates. So this is uh, just a, an interesting attack to see how common now it's, it's become to be able to get around two-factor. Most people assume that two-factor mean that they're 100% secure against like phishing or something like that. But no, if the phishing attack involves two-factor as well, then you can get in the middle here and you can make it so you intercept that too and are able to like log in and add yourself to an account that is enabled with 2FA. So really interesting to just see this campaign in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, definitely recommend checking it out if you want to see how some of these modern campaigns are stealing session cookies and being able to get around the 2FA that people are mandating that their employees use now. Wow. All right. OK, over on my screen, we have, I, I, I don't even get how this is a thing. So apparently, people need password recovery tools. I'm assuming uh, they lose access to their password. Um, and it's for these industrial control systems, uh, PLCs to be uh, exact, which is a programmable logic controller. So apparently, it's very common to get locked out of your PLC in uh, industrial environments. <laughs> so a malware was created, which is a fake password recovery tool. Um, and 
you know, they're, they're selling it or giving it away to these um, industrial people who are using it to get back in their PLCs. But what it does is it turns that PLC into uh, a botnet, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network botnet. Um, and then they use the excess computing capacity on those PLCs uh, to do uh, DDoS attacks and mostly uh, mine for cryptocurrency, which, you know, it. I feel like I shouldn't have to tell anyone not to download something that says it's going to crack your password because, like, I feel like that's sketchy enough to begin with. But apparently that's a reminder some people need. Yeah, so this is interesting because frequently with these programmable logic controllers, the documentation is really poor slash mm -hmm. in another language. So people will go on, they'll do a Google search for, you know, something password recovery because they've locked mm -hmm. themselves out of it. And then, you know, they'll get an application that does what it says it's gonna do, it will break into it, but it will also do a thing or two extra. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you have to ask, like, why is this free? And if it's because mm -hmm. the the people who are putting it out are able to build a botnet on, you know, just giving out compiled code that's really difficult to look into that might, mm -hmm. you know, maybe add some instructions to your to your PLC. Um, that is something that's a very real threat because it allows these people to publish very basic code that uh, you know just like abuses authentication and gets back into a PLC. And while it does what mm -hmm. the user wants, it also creates a very valuable resource for the criminals who are putting out the code in the first place. Yeah, and, and the reason they were able to detect this is because Windows Defender started issuing threat alert and the CPU power throttled up to 100%. Um, but you know, a, a well-crafted uh, malware like this could run on these sorts of systems pretty unnoticed if it's using if instead of getting greedy and using 100 percent of your cpu you know it, it fraction it takes five percent you know or a, or a couple of percent um you know you could have thousands of these systems infected and, and not realize it uh which is very spooky uh and do you have another story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. okay. Over on my screen, I just want to talk about botnets a little bit because there's a new botnet that's come up that's been surprising some people mm -hmm. um, with the way that it operates. This is called the Mantis botnet. And what's interesting about it is that it mostly targets virtual machines and mm -hmm. servers. So, typically, like IoT devices and other vulnerable devices are really easy to add to botnets. And you end up with these botnets that are um, not very not very capable when it comes to the kinds of traffic that they can do because they're very low power. They don't have a lot of CPU power. These botnets are increasingly different. Depending on what kinds of devices you're compromising, you can create very unique botnets mm -hmm. that have super, super um, interesting powers, I guess I would say, by how many resources they have access to. So in, in this case, um, this was a HTTPS, distributed denial of service attack, which is somewhat rare because it's computationally very expensive mm -hmm. to open up a TLS connection and then send a bunch of garbage through it over and over and over. You have to have the ability to create like a cryptographically secure channel, which means that for the attackers, it's, it's very mm -hmm. much a, a burden of resources to do this over and over again and you would have to have a huge botnet of uh, you know like mm -hmm. connected coffee makers or like doorbells or whatever in order to do this but instead they are able to do this sort of thing um, with I think it was like uh, 5,000 yeah 5,067 like devices they yeah. were able to set the world record uh, for 26 million requests per second yeah yeah, and that just goes to show that some of these are also able to take advantage of reflection and amplification attacks, mm -hmm. where by sending right, the right kinds of traffic, they can target other devices on the internet that will, in response to getting traffic, send even more traffic and direct it towards another system. So these botnets are complicated, and they abuse the infrastructure of the internet mm -hmm. to send an absolutely crazy amount of requests to a targeted uh, uh, website or service. So that is just an interesting development here that if you target the right types of devices, you can end up with a relatively small botnet that has a huge capability to cause destruction just because you're targeting devices like, again, virtual services that have access to massive amounts of computing power. And that can be used to uh, do things that other smaller uh, capacity botnets just can't do. Yeah. Um, so we are almost out of time. I do have one last interesting story to look at. All right. Um, which, or you might have another story, but... Um, so ransomware gangs are now uh, putting file structures online, publicly accessible, and indexed so that they're searchable. So essentially what they're trying to do is pressure companies that have not paid the ransom yet into doing so um, 
by a, a variety of methods, by showing the, and making that data easily accessible to other hackers online, um, and then also by targeting um, customers of those companies. The, they'll put up some of these websites where you can search and see, oh, you know, my data is out there because company XYZ uh, got hit with ransomware and they're refusing to pay the ransom. So <laughs> it, it, it's a, a novel new way for uh, people or for um, ransomware gangs to try to strong arm companies into paying the ransom because obviously uh, paying the ransom is highly discouraged. All right, so my last story of the week is going to be on the uh, Cute Bois. Uh, attack campaign. So this is a really interesting and increasingly automated attack campaign against NPM, which we've seen many, many times in the past, for being a victim of supply chain attacks. So what it looks like somebody has done, and they're kind of unsure exactly who's responsible for this, um, is automate the process of signing up and uploading a different code that mm -hmm. is eventually going to be used in an attack. And they even made a website, which I really like, called cupois.info. <laughs> I immediately assume that I should not click on this website at work, but hey, it ended up being fine. Um, and what this is doing is actually attack, uh, tracking the attack in real time and showing off exactly what is going on as um, the attack develops. So I really like the visualization of this because you can see all the malicious packages, you can see the accounts mm -hmm. that are being created, and automation really is the key here. They're using services that allow them to automatically create accounts very, very quickly and do verification in two-factor, um, all in a completely automated way in order to upload all these packages that, Michael, do, do you remember the punchline of what's in every single one of these? Uh, no. Simple miner. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's like the, the, <laughs> the dumbest, like most simple crypto mining thing you can do. It's like just an open source package that anybody can, mm -hmm. can use. And that's why they think that this is not the final form of this attack. Oh, sorry, easy miner, easy miner. Um, mm -hmm. So this is just basically testing to see if a, like kind of a known like malicious slash suspicious um, uh, program can be mass uploaded in an automated way. And as you can see from this visualization, which I love, by the way, check marks, <laughs> I, I have to give you points on this. Um, it's really crazy to see the absolute scale that somebody was able to automate uh, in uploading all these packages and just bombing the platform with tons and tons of, of code um, that's very difficult for them to detect and mitigate. So uh, if you are interested in interesting campaigns, the current campaign against NPM, which is being kind of brought to light by Checkmark, is really cool oh. and weird in the way that it's being done because it looks like it's being uh, like a staging attack for something that's coming up in the future. So um, also an interesting lesson in automation. Mm -hmm. um, some of One of our friends was very interested in automation with like Selenium for a while, so he'd probably be fascinated by this. But by using Selenium and um, a, a mail server that has uh, like a, a, a automated way, like an API you can connect to it and be able to like interact with incoming messages and stuff, mm -hmm. they were able to make a bot that is responsible for the, for the creation of the vast majority of these accounts that are uploading suspicious packages. So um, yeah, the test of a very interesting campaign here and some interesting techniques to get around the protections that NPM is using to protect users from malicious packages. Very cool. All right, so that's all we have time for this week. Mm -hmm. Thank you for also the comments in the chat. It's good to have all of you along with us, and we'll be back next week. Mm -hmm. And after that, I think I'm going to be going to... Well, I was going to say, you might be gone next week already. Maybe. Um, but I'm going to be going to the Hope Conference. Mm -hmm. So I will be in New York uh, doing a talk on $5 cyber weapons and how to use them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think Alex is also going to be uh, at Hope doing a talk on making the nugget. So mm -hmm. if you're interested, make sure to check that out. I think it will also be recorded slash possibly streamed. Um, but hopefully we'll see some of you there. Yeah. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and hack that notification bell. Yes. Make sure <laughs> Definitely make sure to do that. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye.